Welcome to Forum. Whether you are in person or at home, we are so glad that you chose to join us for worship this morning. It is cold outside, so wherever you are, I hope you are warm. It is a great day to to gather uh, with fellow followers of Jesus as we unite in praising him and and align ourselves with his word. Today, uh, I just want to give you a glimpse into our heart as a church. We take moments every year to really reflect and look back at the many ways we saw God move in the previous year. We, we, we kind of call it God at work. And so uh, every year we, we kind of look at and we just kind of summarize the many ways we've seen God move. And I want to direct your attention to the screen as we recount the many ways we saw God move in the year 2020. 2020 has been a year to remember. There were a lot of firsts, a lot of changes, and a lot of innovations that God used to further his mission here in Columbia and at Forum. Although our year didn't go as planned, nothing stopped God from using us to intentionally connect people to Jesus in 2020. 2020 was a year of going big by leading small. Meeting in small groups was an essential piece of ministry this year. We had 27 life groups meet in and around Columbia, and Blake Cohey took over the role of life groups minister. There were over 100 students in middle school and high school life groups this year, and they also spent over 200 hours on Zoom calls when meeting in person wasn't a possibility. In a year full of ups and downs, you were overly generous with your time, talents, and resources. Our amazing volunteers created over 2,000 masks for local healthcare providers and missions partners. As a whole, you gave $2.4 million in tithes and offerings, which is the most that has ever been given. 330,000 of that was given to 30 different missions around the world. 195,000 was given toward the building fund, and 52,000 was given to our benevolence fund during our Choose Each Other Christmas campaign. We proved that we are stronger together as we overcame obstacles to be there for one another. As a church, we reached out to nearly 1,900 people to check in and offer prayer during the quarantine. Our 55 plus ministry sent out 46 weekly emails to 138 members once the pandemic started. We also had fun with our hashtag forum flock around Columbia as 150 flamingos circulated from yard to yard of our forum family. We had some unique opportunities this year to pursue those far from God. From mid-March through July, we averaged 770 weekly views of our forum at home service. Our forum kids team hosted Treat Street, which attracted 1,450 kids from around Columbia that drove through the event, received candy, and heard that Jesus loves them. We have also had the opportunity to partner with two collegiate ministry organizations, Christian Campus House and Stumo, and house their weekly gatherings of over 370 students. Over the course of the year, we continued to empower others to use the gifts that God has given them in order to make a difference. Our new Prayer Pals program partnered 18 new kindergartners with 18 middle school students for the purpose of building relationships and learning about the power of prayer. We also had 221 new volunteers serve during various events and in our different ministry areas. There is no doubt God guided us to love and live like Jesus in new ways this year. Our kids theater performed the song King of Kings via Zoom, which received over 16,000 views on social media. Loaves and fishes continued to reach our homeless population and served over 1,500 meals and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Farmers to Families was hosted on our parking lot five times, where we served 2,000 families, partnered with 19 local churches and organizations, and had 53 volunteers. The opportunity to provide our community with fresh food and vegetables, as well as prayer in this difficult year, was an amazing opportunity to share God's love and be His hands to our community. We will all remember 2020 for different reasons, whether good or bad. But what I hope we remember most is how God never stopped moving in and through his church in order to share the gospel with our community and the world. We are here to intentionally connect people to Jesus. And by his power, strength, and vision, we will continue to do that in 2021. I mean, when you look back, there are so many things to be thankful for and so many things to praise God for. I, I just want to take a moment and say every number in that represents a story. Every number represents a person who has either reached out to or maybe took a next step in following and trusting Jesus in their life. And so don't, don't let that just be a, a, a list of stats or numbers. Let it be a glimpse into the many stories and things God did this year. Now, t- today we're going to start a brand new series 
And this series, I, I'm going to encourage you to lean in. This series is going to be a powerful teaching for all of us to really consider how we view and trust who God is. Because if we're honest, there's a lot of challenges and a lot of things in this world, maybe questions that arise. So today, I want to encourage you as we, we step into this new series to lean in and ask, who, who is God? Open your Bibles to Acts 17 as we do so. Good morning, everybody. It's good to have you with us. I want to welcome you. And to everybody who's, who's watching us online, I want, to, I want to just tell you really quickly, if you missed, for whatever reason, that video that we just played, uh, let me encourage you to go back and watch it. It's, it's kind of like this, this highlight reel of 2020. We call it like just some of the ways that we've seen God at work. And you can go to one of our websites, uh, myforum.me, and right there on that front page you'll see um, the annual report, and it's a great way to just, just share with us in expressing our gratitude to God for all of the great things that he's done. And I was, I was challenged just this past week um, by another pastor as we were talking about the things that have happened. And, you know, sometimes you look back on the things that God has done, and you think he, he operates in ways that's so unexpected. I had no idea he was going to do that. And 2020 has been a lot of things happen that were very unexpected. And to see God move in and through those things is, is remarkable. It's, it's inspiring and encouraging. But here's where the challenge came in. It's like, well, why don't we have that same sense of anticipation that God's going to do the unexpected as we look forward into the future? Why do, why do we only do that when we look in the rearview mirror? And that's a very good question. It has nothing to do with the series that we're starting today or today's message. It's a challenge I want to give everybody uh, as we start off today, to look forward into all that God is going to do with a sense of hope and anticipation, knowing he's going to show up and do things that are very, very unexpected, and I just hope and pray we'll be open to see it uh, when he does. And I'm thankful Blake, Blake mentioned that behind every one of those statistics is, is a story. But here's the, here's the, here's the, here's like the other side of that, like there's two sides to every story, two, two sides to every coin. We, we have the stats for the 18 middle schoolers who were paired with 18 kindergartners as prayer pals. I think it's one of the coolest things that emerged last year. But you know the stat we don't have is, is how many of our middle schoolers for the first time struggled with anxiety and depression and really dark thoughts. We don't, we don't like to talk about those things. We don't share those stories very often. When we do, it's often after something uh, tragic happens. And, and sometimes we can, we can look at the, the good things, the, the good stats, and we should, and be super thankful for them. But on the, on the flip side of those, is, is, God, is God still at work in the hard things? He is. He is just as much at work with those who are struggling with anxiety and depression. Now, it may be a little bit more difficult to see in the moment, but how many of us have come out of a season of dealing with hard stuff and we look back and we're like, I'm so thankful for what God was doing. I couldn't see it. I could only see it in the rearview mirror. And, and maybe the best thing we could do right now is just go, regardless of where we're at, say, I know he's going to do something. I know he's present. I know I don't feel it right now. I don't see it. And those are like, like those discussions are the things we just, we, we're not super good at talking about as people. We don't like to tell people the hardships that we're going through. Often it gets to the point of, of total destruction in our life. That's the moment we finally reach out. And so I would encourage you today, if, if 2020 was one of the hardest years of your life, and it seems like God, God wasn't present at all, and you, you can't share a highlight reel of all the things that he's done, hang on. We, we believe in a God who is faithful and good and who loves us. And that doesn't go away when things get hard. 
And that love doesn't stop. And his provision doesn't stop when circumstances get difficult, even though it's hard to see sometimes. And I know, listen, that's, we took a pretty dark turn pretty quick in this message. But I want to actually like use that other side of things, the other side of the coin, to, to really set up this, this new teaching series that we're starting today called When God Doesn't. Because I think for a lot of us, there are just these moments we find ourselves in when it seems like God doesn't answer our prayers. And what, like, what do you do when that happens? What do you do when God doesn't give you that job that, that you thought you, you earned? I mean, have you, ever, have you like ever had it in your mind that you were so convinced this is the direction God is leading me, this is what God wants for my life, and it just like door after door gets closed and closed and you find yourself way over here? What do you do when that happens? What do you do when God doesn't? And, and that's, kind of the, that's kind of the big question that we're going to be asking throughout this series and, and I want to put it up here. I, I don't think it's something that we naturally think through, but it's something that inevitably we'll, grow, we'll go through. And for many of us, whether it's God doesn't heal, God doesn't answer, God doesn't seem present, God doesn't give, we can fill in when God doesn't with all kinds of different things going on in our life. And it's something that we all have. All of us are going to wrestle with this at some point, either in the past or we're going through it right now or it's, it's about to come. But how we answer this question amongst all of us just in this room is going to be very different. And so all my friends who are joining us in the, in the online forum and you've got that chat feature, this is, this is something I would challenge you right now to put in that chat feature. What do you do when God doesn't? Do you pray? Do you doubt? Do you get skeptical? Do you reach out to a friend? Do you keep it to yourself? Do you internalize it? Is that, is that the breeding ground for your skepticism and your fears? Because for most of us, like 90% of us, I, 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 can, I can say this with some, some surety, we, we don't have a planned strategy for when God does it. We just resort back to like our default settings. And for most of us, the vast majority of us, our default settings, they were given to us. You know, so like, you know, you go to buy a new phone, and you go to set it up, and you log in and do all the stuff, set your region, and then as it, that, that home screen appears, it has a default background. How many of you right now, if I were to look at your phone, still have that default background? Anybody? You're all, some of you are lying today. It's not good to lie in church. How many of you like... Uh, still have your phone, if your ringer went off right now, it's like the stock ringtone or the text tone. Some of you know, I like, this is my mom and dad's phone. They're just like, I don't know, it, I call people with it. It's crazy, you can call people with our phones. I, I'm almost forgetting that. But some people, like myself, it's like, I don't have that phone for 30 seconds and I'm just changing things around. I actually import old settings into, you know what I'm saying, that kind of stuff. And I want us to kind of think of that in, in relation to the deeper things in life. We, we all have default settings and they all come from somewhere. On our phones, it comes from some of the factory settings, but when it comes to our life, for most of us, it comes from our family of origin, the, the environments that we grew up in. We end up mimicking the people that we grew up with and the parents that we were raised by. And one of the, you know, one of, one of the things when you get married, um, those two default settings crash into each other. So I, I grew up in, in this home where uh, I, I, I love my parents deeply. And I, I grew up with a father who's just, he's one of these guys. I don't think they make guys like this too often anymore. Uh, he, could, he could tell you how to like grow a lush lawn while uh, fixing the lawnmower uh, after he had just dropped a transmission out of a car, uh, which followed up, you know, work on the air conditioner. And he's also in his own mind like a doctor. You know, these kind of dads, he's like, he could diagnose all of your problems. He can, you know, climb up on roofs and reshingle things and uh, brilliant in, in all these different areas of life. And so the default setting in my house is when something broke, uh, you took it apart and you, you, you found out what needed to be fixed and you fixed it. And so to this day, when something breaks, I tell people, you know, guys often measure each other by what we can do as handymen, and they'll be like, oh, you, you like Google stuff? 
I'm like, I'm good at taking stuff apart. <laughs> I, I'm super good at that. And whether or not I can put it back together, mm, you know, the debate is out. And so, you know, when I, when I was first married and our refrigerator goes out, my wife wasn't home from work yet. I was very natural. My default was, well, you put all the food in coolers and you take the whole thing apart. You find out what's broken. So when my wife comes home and her default was something breaks in her family, they call people. You need to come and fix this thing. Now she's married to a guy who takes everything apart. You can imagine the, the fun interaction we had that day. That's the default. And so I, I want to just, I just want to just challenge you to think, what, what's your default? And inevitably, some of the, the conflict and the tensions that you have in your life right now are just the simple result. If you have a default system, and the person you're with does too, and they don't often go super well together. But when it comes to this big question, what do you do when God doesn't? Most of us go back to that default system. So as we, as we begin this new teaching series, we're going to ask this question over and over and over again, but we're going to answer it. And really what we're going to do is we're going to realign our default settings when it comes to the bigger issues of the things of God. And for some of us, it's going to be a little bit of a tweak and for others of us, it's going to be a 180 degree shift from what we were given. Because, you know, here's the reality in my own life. When I, oftentimes when I'm confronted with the truth of God's word, you know what I'm confronted with? Some very unhealthy ways of dealing with life. And as I get older, I, I realize just how unhealthy ways of thinking, how I respond, how I react, what those default system settings actually are in my life. And I actually see that as an encouragement. That's just, that's just God saying, here, I'm trying to align you with, with who I am calling you to be. That you don't have to just be the product of the environment that you grew up in. That according to God, you, you are something new and beautiful. And that you and I are actually called to be transformed into the image of Jesus. And so that's just a beautiful invitation. And so through this series, we're going we're gonna to wrestle through these big ideas and dig into those default settings about a really big question. And the reason why I want to use that language of defaults is because our defaults make all the difference. You know, you get into a situation, like you get a phone call, and the doctor gives you the result of that biopsy, and the bottom of your life falls out. That's not the moment you go, you know, thank you so much for that information. I'm going to turn to the word of the Lord. I'm going to let it shape how I respond to this, okay? There may be one of you in the crowd that does that, but the rest of us, we're just going to fall back to that default setting. And when, when it seems like God isn't answering, isn't doing, isn't doing things that we expect him to do, that's not the moment we start to align ourselves with the truth of God's word and really go to him and ask us, shape me in these moments. These are the moments we go back to our default systems, and those defaults make all the difference in the world. They matter. And so as we get into this big idea today, as we talk about it for the next five weeks, we're going to come back to this over and over again. It's going to challenge and encourage and confront us. And before all of you are like, listen, we're not coming back for the rest of this series because it seems a little dark. Let me give you a preview of where we're going to go. Because when we, when we align ourselves with the truth of God's word and when we start asking the hard question, when our default actually gets rewired, what we're going to see is peace. The invitation of God is into the moments when the bottom falls out. Those are the moments when the Spirit of God will breathe into us joy in places that we only knew sorrow before. But you know, to get there, we've got to wrestle through some hard stuff, and that's what we're going to do. And I want to anchor everything we're going to do in this series to one single word. We're going to talk about it every week. It's the big theme of this entire series, and it's a word that may be familiar to some of you. And it's this word sovereignty. The question of what do you do when God doesn't really is a question about God's sovereignty. Now this is one of those words, it's really not used in our culture. It's not used really in any sphere of life other than sort of theological or academic circles. And really the only time outside of sort of Christian language that you hear sovereignty being used is in uh, discussion of nations and discussions of monarchs. And that's actually a really good place for us to just define what sovereignty is. So 
as we talk about the sovereignty of God, as we look at our defaults, as we ask this hard question, really we need to know what sovereignty means. It's not actually a biblical term. It's not a word you're going to find in your Bible. Actually, there's, there's one Hebrew word and one Greek word that sometimes in different translations, they'll, they'll actually use the word sovereignty, but almost every single instance, it's the word for rule or authority. And that's actually a it's not a bad translation to use sovereignty in those instances. So let's jump out of the text and jump out of the world of Christianity for just a second and look at how this word sovereignty is used when we talk about it from a nationalistic sense. This is like political theory. When we talk about a nation being sovereign, all we mean is that that particular nation has a centralized government that has the power, the authority to govern a specific geographic area. This makes total sense. Just think of the United States. There's a specific boundary line. We have a centralized government, you know, other world governments don't have any bearing on how our government works. And before you start typing an email and telling me how everything's interconnected in a geopolitical sense, I, I, I totally get that, but that's not what we're talking about. Clearly defined geographic border, one centralized government, I realize it's all connected to all this other stuff, but there are no foreign powers coming over here and setting up laws, okay? That we, the United States is a sovereign nation, and there are many, many sovereign nations in the world. So that kind of gives us an understanding. Rule, authority, and power. Now when we talk about it in, in sort of an individual basis, when we talk about sovereignty, we're talking about a monarch. We're talking about a king or a queen. Now this is a little bit foreign to us in our democracy or our republic, but there are still places in the world where the ultimate authority over that land or that nation is a king or a queen. If you've ever seen The Crown on Netflix, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Sovereign. They'll even use that word to describe them. They have sovereign rule. So that's a pretty good understanding of what it means now when we talk about sovereignty when it comes to the things of God. Now, this is a simple definition of a very robust theme throughout the scriptures. We talk about the sovereignty of God. We're talking about a characteristic of God. He's all-powerful, all-knowing. He's a creator who governs the universe for his own purpose. There is no higher authority than God. When we talk about the sovereignty of God, can you, can you, you almost see like how our, our big question through this series, what do we do when God doesn't just instantly collides with the sovereignty of God? Because if God is all-powerful and all-knowing, and he loves me, and he listens to me, and invites me into this relationship, why doesn't he do the things that I want him to do? And that confronts a lot of ideas in modern Christianity, where we really turn God into a genie. We just want to rubble them, just to say these little prayers, and you're just going to do what I think is best. And what do you do when he doesn't do that? What do you do when he shows up in really unexpected ways? Well, we're really talking about the sovereignty of God. Now, for those of you who have ever studied or read, I know we've got uh, several scholars and theologians here in the room this morning. You know this is a really deep term. It's, it's, I'm not kidding when it's like it shows up on page one of the Bible and it's at the very end of the Bible and it's literally everywhere in between the rule, the authority of God and how does that interact with me? Well, you've gotten to the heart of the series. So if at any point in the next five weeks you're like, what are we talking about? We're talking about the sovereignty of God but we're coming at it from a hyper-practical perspective. How it intersects with our life. And so today, if you can imagine, you know, the sovereignty of God is a, the discussion is as vast as the ocean. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start on the shore. And we're just going to, like, step one foot into that vast ocean today, kind of the shallow end of things, and just kind of get our minds around this idea and really driving home with this question, what do I do when God doesn't? And what's my default response? That's all we're going to do and we're going to walk uh, through the beginning of Acts chapter 17. And we're just going to, as we walk through this passage, we're just going to be taking that question with us. What do we do when God doesn't? What's the practical application? What does this text say about the sovereignty of God? And how is this challenging my defaults? A very simple structure today. We're going to go to Acts chapter 17. This is going to be one of those teaching series. We're going to focus in on specific words and phrases like, you know, you, you look in my Bible, this, this section in Acts chapter 17 has got markings all over it because it's so, it's just so robust and dense of a text and it shows us a lot about who God is. And so Acts chapter 17 is where we're going to begin. Now, really quickly, before we jump into the text itself, 
This is at a moment in time, you know, I think 2,000 years ago, Jesus has already come. He's given his life. He's come back from the dead. He's appeared to hundreds of people. He's given his mission to his disciples. Your job is to go and make disciples because I'm going. I'm going to come back in a little while. While I'm gone, go and make disciples. And so that's what happens. And this movement of Jesus just explodes all over the known world. And the way that that happens is you have Jesus followers who took what he said very seriously, and they're traveling around telling people about Jesus, that he came back from the dead, that he's the Messiah, that you can be restored and have this right relationship to God just through Jesus. And it's just causing havoc. And so we're we're, we're walking alongside one of his earliest followers when we get to Acts chapter 17. His name is Paul. We refer to him as the Apostle Paul. And he basically lived his whole life uh, in, 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 in sort of the, the Jewish hierarchy, like the upper class of the religious order. As one, of them, one of them was was known as the Pharisees, and he was like the best of the best. When we talk about the Apostle Paul, we're talking probably about one of the most brilliant minds that, that lived 2,000 years ago. And he hated Christians. So much so, like he just dedicated his life to eradicating them from the earth. Because he saw them as like blasphemers. Like he was convinced God is sending me to rid the world of this false cult religion. They're following a false Messiah. And he was on one of those campaigns. He meets Jesus. He meets the resurrected Jesus. And from that moment on, he is never the same. He goes from, from persecutor of Christians to one of the most prolific authors and preachers the world has ever known. Because he saw Jesus and he was like, are you, it's all real? You're, oh, that changes everything. It's the story of so, so many people that I, I run across when people meet Jesus. It just changes everything. So now he's on a mission to make disciples and tell people about Jesus. And we, and we kind of catch him right there as he's traveling around. He, he comes out of Philippi and is traveling through these other towns. And they set up shop for just a little while in a city known as Thessalonica a primarily non-Jewish, Gentile, Roman city, really, really important city. But there was a Jewish synagogue there. Now, that's really important because basically the author here is telling us there's this this little group of Jews living in this Gentile city. You had to have a certain number of Jews to even have a synagogue, which is like their version of of a church, and they would all gather there. That that would be like the epicenter of Jewish culture and life would be uh, revolving around the synagogue. Now, let me give you just a little bit of an idea of where this is geographically. So we come out of Acts chapter 16, and they're traveling from Philippi. They come down through these, these cities' names. I don't want to try to pronounce because I'll sound silly. And then they come to Thessalonica. I can pronounce that one. And then we're going to see, uh, just in a few verses, they're going to go from Thessalonica down here to Berea. Now I'm going to zoom this map out here and show you where we're at geographically. So, you know, this is like Jerusalem, you know, the land of Israel down here. And this is actually where Saul or Paul was from. This is Tarsus. Here's Colossae. And all the way up here is this little square is where we're talking about geographically. Now, here's the boot of Italy. And so you can kind of just kind of orient yourself to where we are in time and space. It's fascinating to think that Paul is traveling all of these regions. He's given his life. Just, I just got to tell as many people as I can about Jesus because it's real. I saw him. It'll change your life, right? That's all he's doing. He's going around telling people this. What I find fascinating is he rolls up into Thessalonica. You know where he goes? He goes to the place that doesn't like Christians. The people that are like, no, uh, you were one of us, Paul, and uh, you know we don't believe in it. That's a cult. But that's where he goes. It was his custom. It was his default. He goes to the synagogue service, and then for three Sabbaths, for at least three weeks, he's there using the scriptures to reason with the people. This is a fascinating word. It's one of the reasons why I've highlighted it here, because it, it means Paul was like using his mind. He was appealing to people on a, on a deeply personal and intellectual level. He wasn't just walking in the door going, I believe in Jesus, you should all believe in Jesus too, because if you don't, you're all going to go to hell, right? That wasn't his approach. His approach was like, hey, I want to show you how all of this, it really just points to Jesus, and all of these prophecies, and the law, and everything was pointing to Jesus. He's the fulfillment of all of it. He's using their own scriptures 
to help them see the beauty of the gospel and what God was doing in revealing himself. Now, here's the thing. Imagine growing up your whole life just believing this one thing. And God showed up literally on the earth. And people were like, no, he didn't. That's outside of my little thing that I believe here. God's doing something totally unexpected. And God's not supposed to do that because God's supposed to do this. And so they didn't see it. Like, Jesus was standing in the front of them. They were like, no, we should kill him. Right? It was a big, huge disconnect. And so what does Paul do in that space of the disconnect? He uses reason. He explains the prophecies and proved that the scriptures talk about the Messiah having to suffer and that the Messiah would come back from the dead. And that was Jesus. I saw him. I'm telling you about it. Like, this is what I'm trying to say to you guys week after week. You know, we kind of have this version. I think a lot of us, anyway, this is actually, maybe this is just how I think. You kind of think you're going to tell somebody about Jesus, and it's going to be this instantaneous, oh, I love the Lord. He saved my life. Forgive my sins. Right? That's just, that's just not often how it happens. It's a little bit slower. It's a little bit more methodical. It may seem even a little bit boring. I mean, three weeks of going to the same place, talking to the same people, just showing them. Let me show you this thing. Many of us, we get bored after five minutes of something. And he's just investing into the lives of these people. I want to show you. Now watch what happens. Some of the people there who were like listening, they were totally persuaded. They didn't see Jesus. They didn't see any miracles. God didn't poke his head out of heaven and go, well, I'm here. They went into God's word and they were like, no, no, no that, no, that totally corresponds to what God has said. They were looking for what God was doing now in the present by going back to see what God had already done and what God had promised and what God had already said. Now, we're getting a lot of indications here. There's a lot of stuff we can start to apply. It's like, mm, what do I do when God doesn't? What do I do when God doesn't act the way that I think he should? What do, I, what do I do when I start hearing things from people about what God is doing? How do I respond to that? Well, some listened and some were persuaded. And I love this little tidbit. Along with many God-fearing Greek men. This is basically a way of saying there were Greek people, Gentiles, living in Thessalonica who were converting or had converted to Judaism. They called them the God-fearers. So you have people not born of the Jewish nation but believed in the one true God. And there was actually a process the nation of Israel had for people like that. And quite a few prominent women. I love these moments in the text. It's like God's trying to show us very clearly. You realize the gospel's for everybody. It's not just for the servants and the, and the poor there were some really powerful people in Thessalonica who heard this message and were like, hmm, that makes total sense. And if Jesus is the Messiah, do you know, I, I think that means everything in my life is about to change. And so as this was happening, like this is like celebration. This is like the highlight reel. Look at all the things that God is doing. But some of the Jews... Not the God-fearing Gentiles, the distinctions being made here. They were so jealous. They were so upset. I think about this just for a second. What, what would have to happen to challenge you so much that you would become jealous of what you were seeing happen? I mean, I, I, th th this should touch on some pretty sensitive spots in our life because what causes you to get so defensive you know, I mean, like, you can look in the culture for five seconds and see, well, when you challenge me in my political ideology, I get pretty defensive. And when I get defensive, <laughs> people will do some really strange things. But what about if you challenge my faith, my long-held beliefs about who God is and how God acts, and you're telling me he's acting in a different way? Do we as people tend to be really, really calm and, and listening no, we get super aggressive and violent. Like, it's, it's almost like, okay, we're, we're going to read like a headline from 
from modern day here. They, they gather some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and they start a riot. When you start to infringe on the rights, the freedoms, the beliefs of people, what do we typically do? Do we stop and listen? Or do we absolutely burn stuff to the ground? It's been happening for thousands of years. The stuff we see going on in our culture today, it is not new. We're just not learning. We're not learning how to make a difference. We're not learning how to make true and lasting change. We're just doing the same stuff, expecting different results. That doesn't, that doesn't work. It's one of the most, one of the most fascinating things I find. I'm, I'm going to go on a little bit of a, a tangent here because many people this month will talk about the civil rights movement, and especially Martin Luther King Jr., and I absolutely love it. What I don't love is how everyone seems to overlook the fact that he was a preacher, he's a minister, and it was the gospel that was driving everything in his life. Suddenly, that, that doesn't make it into the, the nightly special, you know? But how the gospel saturating somebody's life creates a movement of true and lasting change. Mm, I didn't come by burning stuff down. That came from a faithful follower of Jesus said, you know what? God's calling us to something different. And it may contradict your long-held belief, but that's okay. We need to actually come together for these things. We are always stronger when we are together. This kind of stuff, it just divides us. Why not? I'm just, it's like, why do we keep doing it? We know the outcomes, and they're not good. And let me challenge you, my brothers and my sisters in this room here today and those watching online, we can make the difference. Don't think for one second just because of where you are in your circumstance or your isolation or your problems or your community that you can't make a difference. You can totally make the difference in where you live right now. The gospel changes everything. And people who meet Jesus and have their life upended and tell other people about Jesus, it's, it started a movement 2,000 years ago that we're still a part of, right? It's beautiful. Okay, so let's jump back into the message. Are you the kind of person who hears something that's a little contradictory to maybe what you've believed your whole life? Do you become defensive at that? Or do you listen? What's your default? Maybe you grew up in a house. You don't think like us, you're wrong. Well, you're probably more here. I, I think most of us are probably right here. Maybe the best place for us to start today is we start to think about rewiring our default. It's like, is there even a place for listening when, when something's happened that I didn't expect? What do you do when God doesn't? Is your, is your natural reaction to listen? Or is it like, like most of us, is it to doubt and to question? And to wonder, where are you? What if the best thing we could do is just go, what is happening? God, what are you trying to do? And I want to I give, give the people in the crowd that day who were starting a mob, you know, creating this riot, I want to give them a little bit of grace. And I, I think the same thing should, should be for us here today. When people become defensive, man, well, let's just give them a little bit of grace. Because the truth of the gospel is, is the resurrection was the greatest disruption in human history. It is still the greatest disruption in human history. Meeting Jesus will transform your life. It will disrupt everything. And I'm using this language very, very specifically because we're, we're all using the language of disruption now. It's disrupted our workplace, disrupted the economy, disrupted politics, disrupted what home life looks like. So we, can, we totally get what disruption looks like. Now imagine your core fundamental beliefs about life and reality are now being challenged. That's, it's hard. It's hard. And sometimes we are so quick to judge people who don't think like us. Man, let's just, let's just give them a little bit of room to navigate that disruption. And let's, let's maybe take a page from the Apostle Paul here who was like, I'm going to come back. I'm going to work with you. If it takes a month, I'm good. 
I mean, do, would you give somebody in your life a month to walk with them with something that was totally disrupting their, their, their sense of identity and belief? Because most time we give people like five seconds and then we criticize them and judge them. So we're learning some things here as we go through this text. There's a lot of practical application. And I want us to just keep in our mind, what do I do when God doesn't do the things that I think he should do when he doesn't answer my prayers? What do I do when God doesn't? What's my default? And what is God calling me to align my new default system with? Now, let's go into verse 5. Because this mob and this riot, they can't find Paul and Silas. And so they go attack the home of this guy named Jason. They were searching for Paul. They, they wanted to drag Paul and Silas out into the middle of the crowd. Now imagine being drug out into the middle of a riot. Is that going to turn out well? Imagine all the prayers that we would start praying. God protect us. God lead that mob away from me. God please don't let that riot come to my house. I just got the baby to sleep. Please Lord not today. So they didn't find him at Jason's house. He's not here. Well that wasn't good enough. So they dragged Jason out and some other believers. I mean, imagine just getting a knock at your door. Hey, is Paul and Silas here? Nope. Well, you're coming with me. I mean, imagine that. You know the kind of prayer you would say being drug out into a street? I mean, this is kind of the, God, where are you? God, why aren't you doing anything? God, why aren't you intervening? God, this is persecution. God, why is this happening? What do you do when God doesn't? What's the default? They took them before the city council. And here's, the, here's their charges. Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world. And Jason's like, I'm not Paul. Like, my, look, look, my name tag says Jason, not Paul. And now they've, they've come here disturbing our city too. And this guy, he's welcoming them in there into his house. You know what? They're all guilty of treason against Caesar. Okay, Rome's a dominating superpower. You know what the, the result of treason was? Death. There was a mob causing a riot, brought you in front of the city council and said they deserve to die. Imagine, you, you see how the sovereignty of God is, is just saturated all over this text? And we've got to wrestle with some really intense things. Put yourself in that situation. Are you going to start doubting in this moment? God, why are you letting this happen? God, you're not doing the things that you need to do. My three-year-old kid's left at home by himself as I'm in front of this council and they're trying to kill me. God, where are you? And the people of the city, as well as the city council, they were thrown into turmoil. Imagine a city erupting in chaos and violence because there's these guys preaching, God loves you, would do anything for you. That's, it's, I find that so... It's such a strange truth we see in the scriptures. A message of hope and love and grace was inciting violence. And we've seen it happen for 2,000 years. I just think we should never be surprised when a message of forgiveness causes anger and hatred in other people. For most of them, it's going to be just their default. It's probably the home they were raised in. The best thing you and I can do is give them a little bit of room because telling somebody God loves them after thinking God didn't exist is a pretty significant disruption. Maybe we need to start investing a little bit of time into those relationships. Now listen to this. The officials forced Jason and the other believers to post bond. Okay, what did they do? They didn't do anything. I mean, if anything, they were practicing extreme hospitality because word is getting out about Paul and Silas, and you got this little band of Jesus followers in Thessalonica. Oh, Paul and Silas are coming. Man, you should totally come crash at our house. My wife will get a bed ready. I mean, you got to think like real practically, like Jason's wife and family, they probably did a bunch of laundry to make sure there were clean sheets, that the pillows were nice. They probably spent some extra money at the market to make sure they could feed them. Because they were there for almost a month. So word probably got out. No, they're staying over at that guy's house. And so you, you, have, you ever, have you ever kept somebody in your house for a month? Is that super convenient? No, it's not. And now, because of them, you're being pulled out into a riot? And now, it, this is extortion. 
These are the moments that we find ourselves in going, where, where are you, God? Why did I have to empty out my savings, every penny I had, to pay bond so that I don't die for something I didn't do? I mean, have you ever, I know this is true for all of us. We find ourselves in circumstances and situations that just don't make sense, and we turn our eyes to heaven, and we go, what on earth are you doing? Where are you? What do you do? What's your default? I want us to watch what happens next. That very night, <laughs> the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. Hey, guys, it's time to go. Because people are trying to kill you. It's not safe here. So Paul and Silas, they go to Berea. Let me show you where that's at really quickly. They were traveling through this region. They stop here at Thessalonica. The riots break out. They continue on down the road, thankful to Rome who had built roads through this region. They could travel. The gospel traveled on the roads that Rome built. They find themselves in Berea. And what do you think Paul's default was? Facing death? You, you know what it had been like to be Paul and Silas and watch Jason and other believers and family members absolutely hassled, potentially beaten, and their bank accounts drained at they were just showing you hospitality? You know what heaviness I think a lot of us would have felt? Many of us in that moment would have gone, oh, God, I don't know what you're doing, but I think you're closing some doors here, uh, so I'm just going to go home. You think that was Paul's default? No. You know what he does? They arrive in Berea, and they go to the Jewish synagogue. It's like, what? What kind of person does that? Who is relentless? I mean, what, what kind of default do we see here in the life of Paul? I, honestly, I, I think we see, we see a guy who met Jesus and heard Jesus say, I need you to take this message. I need you to like go and tell people. And he was like, yes. And so it didn't matter what came his way. It didn't matter the obstacles or the heartbreak or the death threats or the beatings or the extortion or the riots or the mobs. He was relentless. Ultimately, he's going to give his life because he would not shut up about Jesus. No matter what. You throw this guy in prison, you know what he does? He tells people about Jesus. He tells the jailers and the other prisoners. They let him go. He keeps preaching Jesus. They lock him up again. He's, he's relentless. This is the kind of default wiring I want so desperately for my own life and for everybody be so relentless towards the mission that Jesus has given us to make disciples and proclaim the good news that nothing would stand in our way. And he goes back to the synagogue. That's kind of a hotbed. Last time it caused a riot. Well, let's go. These people need to hear the message. But the people of Berea, they were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica, and they listened eagerly to Paul's message. Uh, some of your other translations will have, they were more noble in character. It's like the people in Berea, it's just a different crowd. They, they heard what God was doing. They heard Paul reasoning and explaining things from the scriptures. They had a, they had a little bit of a different attitude about it. I was like, yeah. They listened eagerly. What are you saying? You gotta get, get, keep downloading this to me, brother. Like, what? Wait, tell, what was that passage? That, you tell, that, that was the, that's about Jesus? Oh, man, this changes everything. And then, then they search the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. Like, uh, I, okay, I hear what you're saying. That sounds amazing. But the only filter, the only lens, the only thing I have to really run that through is, is God's word. And so I hear you making all these connections, the prophets and Moses and all this pointing to Jesus sounds amazing, but... But we're going to have to do some work. And so day after day, they, they, they search through the scriptures. And as a result of that, many of the Jews there believed. And watch what the author here. It's the Spirit of God working through the author. His name is Luke. And so did some of the prominent Greek women and men. Now, this language of prominence, this is like, these are the heavy hitters. These are the people of power and influence and authority in these different towns. Can you see why somebody who had control and authority over a little Jewish synagogue 
And that authority is now being challenged by this, this way of Jesus. And the prominent people in the congregation are now leaving. They're being persuaded. I'm just telling you this right now. In, in church world, this is a real thing. When somebody who's super invested into the ministry is given years of their life, their energy, and their resources to this ministry, when they up and leave, do you know what it does? It makes us go, what is going on? And if there was a movement of people here at Forum, it was like, you know what God is doing? God is moving over here. I think there's a lot of us here today who would go, now wait a minute. No, he's not. He's moving over here. And it would create this incredible division. That's what happened in Thessalonica. But it's not what happened in Berea. And what was the difference? What was their default? Now, I want to remind you, the resurrection is the greatest disruption in human history. It still is for people today. This is where our defaults make all the difference. If you've ever shared the message of the gospel with somebody, you know somebody, you've watched somebody fall back on their defaults. Give them a little bit of room. You're going to go to some people, they're going to become jealous, they may start a riot, they may cause up a bunch of trouble. Some people are going to go, hmm, that's interesting. Tell me more. I love how the Apostle Paul wasn't like, well, I think the people over here are going to be receptive and the people over here aren't, so let's go over here. He was like, I'm just going to tell as many people as I can and I'm going to let them respond. Watch this. But when some of the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God in Berea, do you know what they did? They're still hunting him down. Like, Paul's in Berea, let's go get him. I mean, do you see? Do you see what jealousy creates? It's just, it's violence, but it never stops him. And so let's take all these big ideas that we've talked about early on. Sovereignty of God, our defaults, and this question of what do you do when God doesn't? I want to I sort of think of it, okay, we're going we're gonna to go deeper and deeper into this idea throughout the series, but I, at the very beginning, this is the foundation, we're going to come back to it over and over again throughout the series. The first thing I would challenge all of us to consider as step one in realigning our defaults according to the word of God. Not according to our parents, our, our home of origin, the places that we grew up under the environments and the experiences that we've had throughout our life, but a total realignment to the truth that comes from God. Step one. We learned it from the Thessalonians who were persuaded. What did they do? They listened. What did the Bereans do when they heard the message? They listened eagerly. And you know what else the Bereans did? They were open-minded. But it wasn't just something that they listened to. They were active. They were like, I, this has to make sense according to God's word. Step one for us as we begin to realign our defaults, as we ask the question, what do you do when God doesn't? Well, the first thing we do is we listen with an open mind. And we search the scriptures consistently. When I'm confronted with something that doesn't make sense, that doesn't align with my view of God, the first thing I need to do is not get defensive, but to lean in and go, what are you saying? Let me give you a real practical, real world example. Um, Throughout the past nine months or so, uh, I have this catalog of emails and messages from people on social media about my thoughts and opinions on the end of the world. And shadow governments and conspiracy theories and mask ordinances and everything that has to do with the pandemic and restrictions and what should we do as people of faith. And some of the ideas that people have shared with me, listen, and I I welcome those emails. I believe we, we are stronger together. And some of the ideas that have been shared with me, my default is to go, that's I, I don't have a category for how far out that is. Because there's a lot of misinformation out there. And there's a lot of people who take the text and they twist it to promote prophecies and future dates of Armageddon and, and the second coming of Jesus, which Jesus himself said, nobody knows. Stop thinking about it. But for some reason we're like, no. I think I can predict what it is. Or this guy who's in his basement on YouTube, he totally figured it out. No. Like my default is... But that's coming from somebody's heart for a reason. 
because they care, because it means something to them, because it's, it's encroaching on God doing something maybe different. And I don't want to be like the religious leaders who stood in front of Jesus and didn't see God in the flesh. Can you imagine? Oh, my goodness. You know, some, I mean, this is going to get weird and really personal really fast. Sometimes all I want to do is wrap my arms around Jesus. You ever get into those situations just like, I just need a big old Jesus hug right now because I can't cope with what's going on. Anybody? Can I get an amen? Everybody ever been there? And I get getting in that moment, getting into that place of desperation, and somebody offers you something like, well, here's the truth that nobody knows. It's a secret revelation that I figured out. I can, I can see how in that moment of just crying out to God, how that sounds really appealing. That maybe in a place where I was a little bit more stable, I would be like, I don't know, that doesn't make sense. And you and I, we need to give people a little bit of room because the resurrection is the greatest disruption in human history. Maybe the first thing we can do is listen with an open mind and then say, here's the best thing. Somebody sends you a link. You got someone in your family who's talking about shadow governments and conspiracies and Jesus is coming back at 304 tomorrow. Listen, go, okay. But I got to go here. This is my understanding for all the stuff you're talking about. And that's how I'm going to judge what you're saying. Now, that's the moment. We can actually walk with people. Well, have you ever considered this? Because I know what you're saying is this, but this seems to contradict that. How do you wrestle with that? That's a much better conversation than going, bro, you're crazy. We're not having these conversations with anybody anymore. Paul was in a hostile city known as Thessalonica, and he stayed there for almost a month. And at the end of it, they tried to kill him. And it was, he was relentless in his pursuit of people knowing the goodness of God's love. And I think you and I, oh, what a beautiful invitation. What if we could show the goodness of God's love just by listening with an open mind and searching the scriptures and doing it with people? It's one of the greatest forces for true and lasting transformation in the world. But most of our defaults go a different direction. This is what God is inviting us into. I would encourage you to stay with this, this series as we work to realign our defaults around the truth of God as we, as we jump into this really big idea of God's sovereignty. And I want to condense everything we've talked about today into a single takeaway and a single challenge. What activity of God do I need to be more open to? And maybe you're like me and you might look back on 2020 and be blown away by all the things that God has done. And do you have that same expectation? Are you as open to the things God is going to do as you are at looking back at the things that God has already done? Let's pray together. Our God and our Father, I pray now in this moment you would search our hearts. Because our default has often been to run from you and I, I, I just want you to hear our, our confession of our sin and hear our praise and adoration for you that there is forgiveness for that sin. And Father, as we, it's like, as, as we consider these, these deeper things of who you are, I, I pray that, that it helps us to know you better, that we would draw into a closer connection with you. So I, I'm just praying like for real Give us a deeper understanding of how much you love us. And let that love pour out into the people around us. Use us to be a witness and a light of the gospel to the world. Use our brokenness. Use our faults. Use all of our failures as a megaphone for your goodness and for your grace. So if, so if God, today, uh, somebody who has heard your word, has been convicted by your spirit, I pray you would lead them to a next step. And if we as a ministry can help in any way, help us to be more open-minded, help us to listen, and let us all dive into your word together as we want to know you more. We've gathered here to praise you and to worship you, and in these next couple songs, as we gather around the table, may, may this praise and may this worship be acceptable to you, we pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. As we come to this time of our service where we break bread and come to the Lord's table, I, I can't help but 
hear the message today and really think of this moment in the, the, the Gospels where Jesus, he had just been resurrected. And, and at one point, these disciples were walking to this town and Jesus comes alongside them and is walking with them. And, and he's actually even like telling who he is to these guys. And they have no idea. They, they don't understand who he is. He even preaches the gospel from the, the scriptures on. And finally, they come to this table and they, they break bread. And in that moment, as they broke bread, their eyes are open to who Jesus was. And in, in a moment, he kind of vanishes. And right there in Luke 24, at the end of that chapter, as, as those disciples are recounting, they say, wow, like our, our eyes were opened. He was revealed to us through the breaking of bread. And I think right now as we come to this time of communion, we, we break the bread, we drink the juice that represents his body broken for us, the blood shed for us. We maybe need to reflect on the weight of that choice our Savior made. And maybe as we see the power of his victory over death on the cross and his power over death in the empty tomb, we might actually for the first time have our eyes opened to who Jesus is. So would you join me as we break the bread and take the juice and be reminded and have our eyes open to who Christ is. Let's take communion together. stand with us as we sing this morning.
love never fails, it never gives, it never runs out on me. And your love never fails, it never gives, it never runs out on me. song we're going to sing uh, talks a lot about God's faithfulness. And you know, um, if you're like me, you've prayed many times uh, for things that haven't happened. And um, you've prayed for healing, maybe. Um, you've prayed for a job. I know I've, I've had moments where I'm like, I know God wants me to have this job. And I didn't get it. And I find myself questioning, doubting God in those moments. Does he really care about me? How could he not help me get this. And then uh, it could be a year later or five years later, 10 years later, and I'll look back and go, God knew what he was doing. And I'm so thankful that he's faithful. And that's what we're going to sing about right now. I know you'll make a way And I don't always understand I don't always get to see But I will believe it Yes, I will believe it And you make mountains move You make giants fall And you use songs of praise To shake prison walls I will speak to my feet. I 
will preach.